Texas senators voted along party lines to restrict diversity efforts at public universities. The legislation would ban diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, also known as DEI. Opponents believe it will stop progress to make Texas campuses more inclusive and representative of the population, but supporters say the bill will level the playing field for anyone by focusing on qualifications rather than race. Monica Madden looks closer at the debate. On a very sad situation. Nelson Linder of the NAACP says even 20 years ago, you wouldn't find very many faculty on college campuses who look like him. Yeah, that's the most impressive thing we've seen is more access, more representation. He attributes that largely to diversity, equity, and inclusion offices on campuses, which have become the norm nationwide. It enhances your education experience. People learn from folks who are different. It just makes the environment more rich, more diverse, more ambitious. It's a net gain. There's nothing negative about this, this kind of, these kind of programs. We reached out to several major Texas universities, which said they won't comment on pending legislation. But UT Austin, for example, touts having students from 123 countries and all 50 states on a website page about DEI policies. All of our goal for true diversity. That Republicans disagree that the credit belongs to DEI programs. Minority college admissions across our state have failed to reach goals. And again, the Baylor study showed that in 2018 to 2020, having a DEI office was not only ineffective increasing the number of minority hires within the faculty, but they declined. All of your colleagues that are, are ethnic minorities in this chamber are saying the same thing to you. It's wrong, but you're not listening. We're joined now by Senator Brandon Creighton, the author of the anti-DEI legislation. Senator, thank you for joining us on your first time in studio here. It's my first time here. Good, good to be with you. Happy to have you. Now, Senator, the debate in the bill got heated at times. We just heard from Senator West, who said he didn't feel as though you and your other Republican colleagues were listening to persons of color in the legislature and their concerns on this issue. How are you addressing that? Yeah, we, you know, I have great respect for Senator West. We had a long seven hour debate uh, on the Senate floor uh, for the diversity, equity and inclusion legislation. Uh, personally, I feel like the, the committee process was very thorough, right? Senator West was in the subcommittee on higher education to vet the legislation. He was also in the larger um, at large Senate education committee when the legislation came through, was very active in the committee with the witnesses. Uh, many, many conversations related to the bill. Why do you think that eliminating these programs is the best path forward towards a more inclusive environment on college campuses? Well, the, the case uh, I presented in hearings and also through so many hours of debate on the Senate floor, it clearly showed, just irrefutably showed, that DEI is not working for minority faculty recruitment. Over the last 10 years, uh, there have just been dismal results the DEI units and programs have been somewhat weaponized with these loyalty oaths or required diversity statements that has a chilling effect on uh, those that, that feel comfortable applying in general, uh, maybe that, that don't ab agree with the political uh, ideology that's exhibited through those required oaths. Uh, that's the same thing that we're seeing in California. We're seeing it among Texas universities. That is compelled speech, right? When you have compelled speech, you do not have free speech. And if you don't have free speech, you have exclusivity. And if you're being exclusive, DEI falls. Senator, you've also been leading the front carrying a bill on a priority of both the lieutenant governor and the governor. That is the education savings account, which for our viewers who might not be familiar, that is, you know, public, allocating public dollars to families who want to send their children to private school. Um, you know, talk a little bit about some of the how you've been addressing some of the concerns from your colleagues from rural um, rural districts. Rural Republicans have said that they are concerned about this because they, some of them don't even have private schools in their area. So how are we making sure that this is um, applicable to anyone? You know, uh, for uh, school choice and parental uh, education freedom, uh, all the things wrapped up in Senate Bill 8, the parental rights that are just paramount for our moms and dads across the state to make the decisions that are best for their children's education, I stand for that. And so I, I think uh, knowing that we would be the 31st state in the nation uh, to advance 
a major school choice program. We'd be the, the ninth or tenth state with an education savings account. They, they really haven't, from Arizona in its uh, fourth iteration over 30 years, Florida in its third iteration over 20 years, we really haven't seen a lot of use of the ESAs in rural areas. But what I would say to our friends uh, that represent rural areas, and I'm one of them, right? I would say that um, if those um, alternative private schools as opportunities or choices are not available, then the ESA is not really an issue uh, in the first place because kids are going to stay in those private schools and not seek them. Now, pivoting to another topic that's important, this week the House and Senate named its members of the conference committee to hash out the differences right. of the budget. You're one of those five senators. Talk about some of the challenges that lie ahead in those negotiations. Yeah, I'm excited that Lieutenant Governor Patrick asked me to serve as a budget conferee. Uh, as you mentioned, those are the final negotiators between the Senate and the House to reconcile those two budgets and their differences. So we've got some major work to do. Uh, there are always differences in the priorities of the Senate and the House for the budget. There's also great alignment. So we've got some incredible opportunities to land the plane for historic support for public schools, for our teachers. Uh, for our retired teachers and cost of living adjustments and a 13th check uh, uh, combined. That's really incredible. Um, we've got to show our teachers that when they enter the profession that we've got a destination for them when they leave the profession later on after their career is over. And we're addressing both. School safety is an incredible opportunity. We'll, we'll have between 600 million and a billion three and invest in, in school safety and we have a lot of incredible initiatives there. One area where there isn't alignment yeah. is the differences between the House and Senate proposals on property taxes. We've yeah. heard the Lieutenant Governor say he doesn't want to negotiate with bad math. So how specifically are you and your members in the House going to iron out those details? Yeah, I think uh, property tax uh, overall, if we're negotiating on how to lower property taxes for everyday Texans and businesses, I think we're all winning, right? So the House and the Senate have different plans, but that's what the budget conferees are for, is to work out the details on how to reconcile and blend the best aspects of both plans, and I believe we'll do it. All right, Senator Creighton, thanks so much for joining us on okay. Save Texas. Lawmakers push for power to stop local policies in some of the state's largest cities. How new bills moving through the legislature could let people at the Capitol remove rules approved in your community.